Welcome to my channel. I am going to walk you through the process of valuing four oil and gas Canadian stocks and analyzing their financial ratios. Become a member of the channel and I could do a more in-depth valuation or we can do a private Zoom session where I show you how to analyze financial statements and answer any questions. See the link in the very top of the description. The first company we're going to look at is ARC Resources. This is an oil and gas EMP company. EMP stands for Exploration of Production, which is the early stage of energy production. This includes searching and extracting oil and gas. This company is the second largest Canadian oil and gas trust. ARC was founded in 1996 as a royalty trust with the acquisition of 21 properties from Mobile Oil Canada. The acquisition was funded by an IPO of $180 million on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This company has a market cap of 2.2 billion Canadian dollars and they trade at 6.15 a share. To calculate the shares outstanding, that's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding 358 million. We're gonna need this number later when we calculate the value of the company. Let's look at our financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and then discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So when you invest in a company with free cash flow, that means they have the ability to pay you a dividend, to pay down their debt, to acquire other businesses, and to grow their company. But if you invest in a company without free cash flow, with negative free cash flow, it can't do any of those things. This company's free cash flow is kind of all over the place. It's a small number in 2016 of 2 million, then it's a big negative in 2017, goes back to positive in 2018, and negative in 2019. You generally want to invest in a company with positive consistent numbers. If a company has negative free cash flow, they could be investing in their business to grow it for later on. They could be selling a product on credit. When you sell on credit, you're booking the income on the income statement, but you're not receiving cash until a later time. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And this company has positive net income in three of the four years. It looks like 2019 was a bad year for this company. Their revenue doesn't look so great either. It's 1 billion, then it goes all the way up to 1.5 billion, then it comes down to 1.3 billion. You generally want to see a company increasing their sales each year, especially in 2019. That shouldn't have been a bad year. I could see 2020 having a decrease in sales. Let's look at the capital structure. 878 million Canadian dollars of debt. They pay 5.5% interest on their debt and the cost of debt is 3.66%. To get cost of debt, it's interest rate times one minus the effective tax rate. They only have 20% of debt in their capital structure, which means they have 80% equity. The cost of equity is 18.68%, and we use a capital asset pricing model to figure that out. And the beta is part of the equation for cap M, and the beta is really high, 2.13, so that means the stock moves more than twice the market, it's a pretty volatile stock. The higher the beta, the higher the cost of equity. Their WAC is 15.6%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity, and that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 3.4 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using a weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of 2.6 billion Canadian dollars. We divide that by 358 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 725. They're trading at 615, so they're trading at a 15% discount. So it's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street has them at 1168, so they're saying the stock is really undervalued. Let's see where the stock has been trading at the past few years. So the stock was trading over $20 about three, four years ago, but it keeps coming down in price. The lower the stock price, the more appealing the valuation is, especially if you value a stock at say $10 and it's trading at $20, it doesn't look appealing. But if it goes down to $8, now it's a good value. Let's look at the financial ratios. They don't have a good PE because they have negative earnings. The median for the market is 16.7, the average is 18.6.
PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income, so they have negative PE. Price of sales can never be negative, and they have a good price of sales of 1.7. The median is 2.0, the average is 4.8. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, they're at 1.7. So investors are paying $1.70 for $1 revenue. Really good price to book. The median is 2.4. The average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5. They're at 0.6. So investors are paying $0.60 cents for $1 book value. That's a really good ratio. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. Not a good interest coverage ratio. The median is 4.1, the average is 13.5. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. I like to see above 2.0, they're at 1.9. So they can cover their interest payments, they just don't have a lot of money left over. And EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes. It's on the income statement called operating income. ROE is bad. The median is 13%. The average is 15%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%. They're at negative 1%. Current ratio is pretty bad. The median is 1.3. The average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2. They're only at 0.5, so they cannot cover their current liabilities, which means they may need to take on more debt. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Baker Hughes, Canadian Natural, Crescent, Diversified Gas and Oil, Denberry, who went bankrupt, that's why they're in red, Marathon Oil, Occidental, Shawcore, Transatlantic, Texas Pacific, US Energy, Seven Generations, and Whitecap, all in the same industry as ARC. And if ARC has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse in PE because they're negative. Price to sales, they're a little worse than the average at 1.7. Price to book, they're doing much better than the average at 0.6. Much worse in current ratio, 0.5. The average is 2.4. ROE, they're worse. Debt, they are better in debt at 20%. The average is 33%. And in terms of market cap, when converting them to US dollars, they have 1.7 billion. The average is 4.8 billion and they do pay a higher dividend. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 15% discount because their stock price has come down so much, but their ratios and financials don't look so good. The next company we're gonna look at is Crescent Points. This is also an oil and gas ENP. It focuses primarily on light oil production in Southern Saskatchewan. It's Canada's 12th largest oil and gas producer. Let's get started with the model. This is a small company under 1 billion market cap. They trade at $1.64, so they're a penny stock, and they have 530 million shares outstanding. Their financials look pretty bad. They have free cash flow in two to four years, but every year they have negative net income. Their revenue is okay. It does jump from 2016 to 2017, but it's pretty steady from there on out. Let's look at the capital structure. They have $2.9 billion of debt. They pay 5.9% interest on their debt, and that's the cost of debt. Since they don't pay taxes, they lose money. The weight of debt is 35%, which means they have 65% equity in their capital structure. They have a really high beta, 3.25. It's a really volatile stock. It moves more than three times the market. So they have a high cost of equity over 27% and the WAC is about 20% which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value that's all cash flows past year for that's 2.1 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weight average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of 1.7 billion. We divide that by 530 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of $3.28. They're trading at 164, so they're trading at a 50% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street has them at 526, so they're also saying the stock is undervalued. Let's see where the stock has been trading at the past few years. 
This stock was trading over $20 a few years back, but the price keeps coming down and down. So it doesn't look good for this company, but if things pick up, you could make a really nice return. Let's look at the financial ratios. They have a bad PE because it's negative. They have negative net income. They have a really good price to sales ratio. That's stock price of a sales per share, 0.3. Really good price to book. That's stock price of a book value per share, 0.2. They have a bad interest coverage ratio. They lose money on their operational business. They lose 862 million Canadian dollars last year just on its regular everyday business before paying any debt and interest. So it can't even cover its interest payments. Negative ROE because they have negative net income and their current ratio is below one so they cannot cover their current liabilities. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on ARC, Baker Hughes, Canadian Natural, Diversified Gas and Oil, Denberry who went bankrupt, that's why they're in red, Marathon Oil, Occidental, Shorecore, Transatlantic, Texas Pacific, US Energy, Seven Generations, and Whitecap, all in the same industry as Crescent. And if Crescent has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they are worse in PE, of course. They are better in price to sales and price to book. Current ratio, they're below average. Negative ROE, so that's worse, of course. They have a little more debt than average. Market cap is really low, so that's lower than average. And they don't pay much dividends, only 0.59% dividend yield. To summarize, I do have them trading at a 50% discount because the stock price is so low. Their ratios and their financials look terrible. The next company we're going to look at is Imperial Oil. This is Canada's second biggest integrated oil company. ExxonMobil owns 70% of this company. Let's get started with the motto. They have a 12 billion market cap. They're trading at 1640 a share and they have 732 million shares outstanding. Now these financials look good. They're positive and healthy and consistent. And look at a free cash flow, it goes up every year. Starts at 900 million, jumps up to 2.8 billion. So they have lots of cash to use to grow their business. Net income also looks really good, a couple billion dollars a year. They did have a bad year in 2017, but it's still positive. Revenue is moving in the right direction, 23 billion to 32 billion. So everything looks good in their financials. Let's look at a capital structure, $4.7 billion of debt. They pay 2% interest on their debt and cost of debt is 1.5%. Only 16% of their capital structure is debt, which means 84% of its equity. They do have a high beta of about 2, so the stock moves 2 times the market. And the cost of equity reflects that, 17.45%. Their WAC is 15%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 21 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $19.7 billion. We divide that by 732 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price at $27. They're trading at $16, so they're trading at a 39% discount. Another strong buy. Simply Wall Street says the stock price is worth only $9.53, so they're saying it's overvalued. Let's see where the stock has been trading at the past few years. The stock was trading above $40 at one point, but the price has been coming down. So it might sit down there at these low levels. We're not sure how long it's going to take to get back up there, but this looks like a healthy company that probably will get back up to where it was. Let's look at the financial ratios. Really good PE, that stock price over earnings per share, they're at 5.5. Also really good price of sales, that stock price over sales per share, that's 0.4. Good price to book, stock price over book value per share, they're at 0.5. Really good interest coverage ratio, that's EBIT over interest expense, they're at 23. Not such a great ROE, that's net income over equity, only 9%. And they have a good current ratio, that's current assets over current liabilities, they're at 1.4. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Canovis, Husky, Suncor, and Exxon, all in the same industry as Imperial. And if Imperial has a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. They're a little better in price to earnings, 
price of sales, and price to book. They have the highest current ratio of all five companies. ROE, they're a little better than average. Debt, they're a little lower than average. They are small than average because Exxon brought the average up to 38 billion and their dividend yield is high at 5.2%, although Exxon pays 9.4%. So to summarize, I've been trading at a 39% discount. Their ratios look really good and their financials look really good. The fourth and last company is Pembina Pipeline. This company transports and stores oil and natural gas in Western Canada. Let's get started with the model. This is also a pretty big company, 16 billion market cap. They're trading at $29 a share and they have 560 million shares outstanding. They do have negative free cash flow in two of the four years, so they could be investing in their company. Things are improving because they do have a nice positive free cash flow in 2018 and 2019. Net income looks really good. It's growing about 400 million a year. And their revenue looks great. It grows from 4 billion to 7.2 billion. Let's look at the capital structure. They have $10 billion of debt. They pay 3.1% interest on their debt. And cost of debt is 2.3%. They have 38% debt in their capital structure, which means they have 62% equity. Cost of equity is 15.8%, and we need the beta to figure that out. That's 1.76, so the stock is a little volatile. It moves almost two times the market. Their WAC is 10.7%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 14 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using a weighted average cost of capital. We, we get a value of the company of 11.4 billion Canadian dollars. We divide that by 560 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $20. They're trading at 29, so they're trading at a 42% premium. It's a strong sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is in the other direction. They're saying the stock is worth $36, so they're saying the stock is undervalued. Let's see where it's been trading at the past few years. Another oil and gas stock that got killed, its stock price was cut in half pre-COVID. So it looks like it could be a good buy, but according to my model, it's not. Let's look at the financial ratios. They have a really good PE, price of sales and price to book. PE is stock price over earnings per share, they're at 10.9. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share, they're at 2.2. Price to book is stock price over book value per share, they're at 1.0. A good interest coverage ratio that's even over interest expense, they're at 5.4. They don't have such a good ROE, that's net income over equity, only 9%. And the current ratio isn't too good. That's current assets over current liabilities, so they cannot cover their current debts and payables. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on Intero, DHT, Enbridge, Enterprise, Energy Transfer, Euronav, Frontline, Kinder Morgan, MPLX, Noble, One Oak, Plains, and PBF Logistics. All in the same industry as Pembina. And if Pembina has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they are a little worse in price to earnings and price to sales, but much better in price to book. So they have a good balance sheet. Current ratio, they're not doing that well in. They're under one, the average is one. And in terms of ROE, they're much worse than the average at 9%, average is 22%. They are doing better in debt, which is probably why they have a good balance sheet, 38% debt compared to the average of 53%. They are a little lower than average in market cap. They're 12 billion US dollars compared to about 15 billion US dollars. So for dividend yield, they do pay 8%, which is normally high, but for this industry, it's really low. The average is 14%. Look at DHT paying 36% dividends. So if you want a big dividend payment, go into oil and gas midstream. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 42% premium. Their ratios look a bit weak and their financials are okay. And become a member of the channel and I could do a more in-depth evaluation or we could do a private Zoom session where I show you how to analyze financial statements and answer any questions. See the link in the very top of the description. Thanks for watching.